Today's episode is brought to you by Cobia. Designed by anglers, Cobia boats are the perfect balance of fishing smarts and comfort. It's not just best-in-class quality and performance. They have superior hole design, intelligent deck layouts, and more user-friendly helms. Cobia boats are family-friendly while maintaining that tournament-grade fishing performance. Check out their full lineup of center and dual consoles at cobiaboats.com and give them a follow on social at Cobia Boats. Choose Cobia and have it all. Welcome to another episode of the On the Water Podcast. I'm Jimmy Fee. I've got Anthony DeCicci here, and we have a great episode ahead talking with Joseph Diagostino, known uh, more widely among the fishing community as Joe Bags, kind of about how he got his lure company started and his background in fishing and some of the great fishing he's experienced over the last couple of years. But before that, uh, I figured me and Anthony would talk about some of the fishing we've been doing right now. We're in the heart of the spring striper run. We're right at the transition between late May and early June. And that's one of those times a year where the striper fishing is, is great just about everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I was excited to uh, try something a little different uh, with Jim recently, which was an experience. Yeah. Anthony, he, he kind of wouldn't take no for an answer in asking me if, uh, I would take him surf fishing and Anthony does a lot of fishing. He's a very good fisherman, but he doesn't do a lot of surf fishing and, and surf fishing is kind of a different surf fishing is a bit of a different. Uh, there's Jimmy's a lot. really, really, really protective of his surf fishing for good reason. So he doesn't want any tag alongs ever, even if you happen to be one of his best friends. It's not even about being protective. It's more about it's a selfish thing. It's where I don't want I don't want any tag alongs where like I want to go and there's only so many days in May and June when you have your shot at a big striped bass. And I don't want to be dragging he didn't want an anchor. This pot's holding him back. Is exactly. what he's going to say. I don't want to be dragging an anchor around the beach while I'm trying to catch a 50 pound striped bass. But Anthony did great. The fishing was a little bit slower. Really, kind of the only excitement we found was we're out there fishing and there was this horrific, horrific smell. And I'm somebody who's well accustomed to bad oh, smell. Oh, yeah. He's like three steps down. Uh, heading towards a spot where there may or may not have been salt water to cast into and goes, um, dead mammal. <laughs> like, like as soon as the smell hit his nose, I'm like, what? Yeah, it was just, it was so thick. Like, I feel like you could taste the smell, uh, if that makes any sense. Like, it was, it, the air felt heavy with it. And eventually we found it. It was an enormous dead seal. Yeah, it thing was massive. It, like, it was kind of surprisingly large and very well decayed and jimmy was dry heaving he's got to have the weakest stomach of anybody i know especially if you've ever sat in his passenger seat in his vehicle it's like how does somebody whose vehicle smells this bad have such a weak stomach and uh that was kind of kind of one of the first i guess noteworthy things that we experienced that night yeah yeah it uh I think, the re let me defend myself for a second. I think the reason I was dry heaving is we were so close to it on the way out where you're, you're walking out and all of a sudden it's just this mound that looks like it could be a rock. It could be, you know, a big lump of seaweed. And then before you know it, you're three feet from it and just being hit with this smell. It, 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 there's no way to describe it. I mean, the fish was, or the seal was pretty well decayed, had a hole. You could see the rib cage, but there's, it was still largely intact other than that. Didn't look like a shark had gotten it. Just kind of natural cause. Yeah, I couldn't really tell if it was like, you know, maybe hit by a boat or something like that. Or the decay, the way it decayed, there was like a spot in the back that was kind of like bare or looking like it was damaged. And then the rib cage, but it could have been a mix of decay and who knows, maybe just, just rash from rubbing up against the rocks if it got, you know. Now, this is going to sound dumb, but, but things like that are part of the reason I like surf fishing in the way that it forces you to slow down and you really are part of the environment. Not that I'm going out there hoping to find... A big dead seal. It's very immersive. Yeah, the whole exactly. experience is very immersive. It's a lot different than you know. I I'm a, more accustomed to boat fishing and stuff. I've done plenty of fishing from shore. Wouldn't call it surf casting, uh, especially with with you know experiencing that at an extreme level with Jimmy. Um, it's it's really immersive. It's very it's very cool. It kind of feels like. Like bow hunting for for deer, almost in a it, like the fishing equivalent of that, you know, where you're part of that whole ecosystem at such an intimate level. 
right? Yeah. That's, that's what I, that's my, that was my take home from No, it. no. And, and I agree with you. I mean, where is, if you're in a boat, you are rocking out to the spot as fast as your boat will take you. And with the surf, like you're forced, you, you're, you're going at a walking pace to and from. So maybe you find some lures washed up. Maybe you see some animals. I mean, some, I've, I've had some incredible encounters out in the surf that are completely aside from the fishing and, you know, coming across a big smelly animal. And then also seeing the seal out there with Cheech uh, <laughs> w- was one of them. We didn't end up catching some fish. We, we went to another beach and uh, caught a handful of bass up into, I'd say, what are now overslot fish. And, and that's something worth mentioning, too, is if you haven't heard yet, the new striped bass regulations in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Connecticut are one fish 28 inches to 31 inches so they have narrowed the slot limit on striped bass that's going to apply to all states but they have a deadline of july 2nd those states i mentioned again new hampshire massachusetts rhode island and connecticut all put that into place ahead of uh, memorial day so the other states have until july 2nd to follow is that that's the deadline so when they put this emergency action into place it declared they were reducing the maximum size of a striped bass you could harvest from 35 inches in new england 38 inches in new jersey when they reduced it from that to 31 inches the the states had until july 2nd to put that into place but most of the states wanted to get that uh get that underway as soon as possible but when we did finish up the surf fishing uh it it was it was pretty late it was about 3 a.m and uh you know, it's a late night, especially you come home, the kids are up early the next day, and then you've got to go to work. So I wanted to ask Anthony and bring up something that we, we mentioned, uh, we wrote about in the magazine back in the fall of your preferred form of caffeination. <laughs> now, a- a- Anthony, I see him in the mornings, and he is often very energized. Oh, yeah. Uh, talking on the phone, talking away, telling fish stories, or uh, more often stories about how he's, he's won a waffle online for, to win an exclusive bait. But go ahead and tell me, what is your preferred form of caffeination? Um, uh, an iced Americano, black. Yeah, yeah just that simple. Yeah, just some espresso over some ice in a, in a, in a large, large, large cup. And then uh, when calls like that come in to, you know, do something in the wee hours when I'm normally maybe sleeping... I, I usually step my game up. Like that morning, I, I the first thing I did was grab a Celsius, which also has caffeine in it. Started on that on, on the way to get my coffee um, and had that large iced Americano. And then made one more stop to grab a peach Red Bull at the convenience store for oh. the afternoon just to get oh, no, through the, the day. Those empties you crumpled up and threw in the back of my truck. Yeah. So I, I knew what you were drinking that night. Uh, but when I surveyed a bunch of surf fishermen from throughout the coast, most of them did say coffee. Yeah. So I, I, I asked guys um, from, let's say, Maine, I believe. We had a couple in Maine all the way down to South Jersey. And it was uh, the article was Fall Run Survival Guide. And one of the questions I posed the, to the surf casters was, what's your choice of caffeine? And I, I have some of the answers here. We also have the article online. I'll throw the link up. But... Uh, Finn Hawley, who's a North Shore surf guester, young guy, really great fisherman. He said coffee. Jared Wood, another uh, Penn Pro staffer, great surf caster. He said coffee as well. Liquid IV energy multiplier. Somebody else said. I never heard of that one. Now, Sounds I feel like, like some I've had it. stuff. That does. That's some top shelf. That sounds like you drinks. need a prescription for it. <laughs> I think so. I, I feel like I, I could be an energy drink sommelier. Like, I've hmm. had most of them. I've been around for a while. I was doing something I called go juice after my surf fishing trips where I'd get to work and I would take a caffeinated seltzer and pour a five hour energy into it, sometimes two. And that was what would get me through the day. We're, we haven't got to that part of the season yet. That usually happens around mid June that, that I start breaking That's out the go That's when the uh, performance warnings start coming in from, uh, from Kevin saying, Jimmy, you look terrible. You're d- disheveled. You smell bad. You're in the throes of your surf season. Get it together. Kid. I mean, I'm, I'm always hovering around that limit, but uh, it usually puts me past it. <laughs> uh, coffee and lots of it. Somebody said power naps. So one of the fishermen, Toby Lipinski, who's the uh, editor of the Fishing Wire and another really uh, prolific surf caster, he said he used to do the five-hour energy energy drink thing. And now he said, you know, we realize that's probably not the healthiest thing for you. So he tries to pepper in some power naps throughout the day to keep him going uh, at night. Yeah, I like that uh, tactic. I always screw that whole dynamic up because I'm like, I'm going to take a nap. And then the first thing I do is like crack open something with caffeine in it, start drinking it. And then I'm like, oh, I just 
I guess I can't take a nap now. So what, what kills me, it, in my, my after work nap has been absolutely annihilated by my two children because yeah. you just can't come home and be like, all right, I was at work all day. I'm going to fish all night and uh, you two go let the let TV babysitter take care of you. <laughs> so that's, I've had to be more strategic about that. So another, here's an interesting one and one I never heard of. And this is from Jerry Aldette, who's a, a surf fishing writer. He does a lot of writing for a lot of other magazines, including On the Water. And he wrote that on his ride home, so sometimes, and that's a really scary thing and a safety issue, not only for you, but for the other drivers on the road, is when you're coming home and you're feeling tired, you want to make sure you're alert. You don't want to have those one minute blinks. That could be a really scary situation. And he said on the drive home, he will eat peeled large carrots, raw carrots, and cr he said the crunching and the eating of the vegetable is what keeps him awake on his drive home. And it also ends up being a healthy snack. Wow, that, that that is that's an experienced man right there. That is that's uh, and and a healthy man because yeah. usually my post surf fishing is I come home afterwards, and I plow through whatever leftovers are in the fridge. I'm yeah. a big time night eater after surf fishing. Uh, uh, did, what did you eat after our trip? Um, I don't think so. I don't recall actually. Probably who knows? Have you seen me lately, Jim? <laughs> I, I, but you're looking good. The, the beard's trimmed up. I'm the. I feel like I'm. I, I look like ten miles of bad road, and I feel like twenty miles of bad road. <laughs> I don't think so. I think I. Uh, I think I crawled into bed and and fell asleep with a smile on my face. It was fun. I I didn't drown. Um, I didn't fall. I lived up to my uh, my self given uh, moniker of uh, the snow leopard. Which was a carryover from a steelhead trip and treacherous terrain. This is too inside jokey. But anyhow, Anthony refuses to buy corkers for whatever reason. And we went and we were steelhead fishing on the Niagara River, which is pretty treacherous terrain, not, not unlike the surf here in the Northeast. And uh, he doesn't have his corkers. I go, well, you need cleats. You have to go with cleats. He goes... I'm the snow leopard. They call me the snow leopard. He was giving himself all kinds of nicknames. <laughs> Jordan uh, or uh, Gordon Lightfoot had just died then. He was also called, Cheech was calling himself the pride of the American side, which, <laughs> which is a quote from the Gordon Lightfoot song, one of the greatest songs ever, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, back on back on track. Back on track. Uh, away from Anthony's nicknames. So here's a quote from Craig Cantelmo, who works for Van Stahl yep. uh, Reels. If you own Van Stahl and plenty of surf fishermen out there do. Craig is instrumental in getting these reels designed, getting them to the tackle shops. And his response, he's also a very hardcore fisherman, as you would expect from somebody who works for, uh, for a company like Van Stahl. He wrote, my son turned me on to rain energy drink, and it's a game changer for fishing two tides in a row. But be careful going beyond two cans or you'll look like me. Don't worry. The uncontrollable twitching wears off in a few hours. <laughs> so, that is one of the quotes I have. I've got one more to close this out. And this is from uh, among the other people we, uh, we surveyed was John Skinner. John Skinner has an immensely popular YouTube channel. Before that, he was an author. He wrote some of my favorite books on surf fishing. Fishing the Edge is a book he wrote. And that was one of my absolutely favorite surf fishing books. It peppered in instruction with fish story, with storytelling. He was, he was always, he's always great at that with this writing where he's going to tell a fishing story, but there's going to be some, some kernels of information within there. So John Skinner wrote, and I feel like this is exactly the type of thing that he would write. If you watch his YouTube channel, if you've read his books, he wrote, why would I need a stimulant when I'm fishing? That's great. That is kind of the perfect answer. But we're some of us are mere mortals, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I am still relying on. I'm approaching go juice season. I've been trying to move off the five hour energy. I agree with that, though. You don't need the stimulant to fish. You need it to recover and be productive outside of your fishing. I think that's how I use it, anyways. I need to prevent the oversleeping. Like I, when I get home and I'm like, I'm going to sleep for three hours and then I'm going to get out. It is so easy for me to hit just snooze. You know, yeah. like that. I go to sleep when my kids go to sleep. I'm trying to catch in a couple hours of sleep before the tide. All and right, that is that. just a, that's hard to do. It's very hard. It's hard to get up, like especially if you've been out a, a, the previous night and you're already tired. So like having a, a you know big cup of coffee then and just staying up until the tide instead of trying to catch a nap beforehand. It's a slippery slope. It's a very slippery slope. It's tough to do this and remain gainfully employed. Yeah. And and maintain the only, your children. <laughs> this, this might be the only place that that can be done. Yeah, I, I, I got to give it, like, there, not everywhere would, would appreciate somebody coming in looking like I look today, just <laughs> finding a hat to cover up my greasy hair. Um, but anyhow, on to, uh, 
the actual topic at hand. Anthony? Got, I had a chance to sit down with, with Joe Diagostino from Joe Bags, which uh, was awesome, kind of, you know, having him tell that journey of, of taking a lifelong passion of fishing and turning it to something that pays the bills. Um, so it was fun talking fishing with Joe. Um, stay tuned for, for that interview to follow. And, um, and if you've been enjoying this podcast, please take a second, give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, leave a comment below, let us know what you like, what you'd like to see. And, uh, thanks for tuning in guys. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Kobe Boats, bringing you this episode of the on the water podcast. From tournament fishing to cruising with family and friends, Cobia Boats will hook you with fishing features done right and comfort that doesn't quit. Check out their full line of center consoles and dual consoles at cobiaboats.com and give them a follow on social at Cobia Boats. Choose Cobia and have it all. What's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to the On the Water podcast presented by Cobia Boats. I have today with me Joe Diagostino from Joe Bags or the, the founder of Joe Bags Tackle. Um, and uh, we're going to kind of explore a whole bunch of stuff um, today. It's just after Memorial Day weekend, so we got to kind of, you know, knock the cobwebs off of getting back into the work week. But uh, how was your Memorial Day weekend? Uh the weekend was awesome. Spent a lot of family time. I didn't really do too much fishing this weekend, but I did get the time on the water with the family, the beach. We traveled to New London, Connecticut. Nice. Uh, getting back into the work week. We got a huge week ahead of us. A, a lot of work to get done. Uh, got some product coming in. Uh, have to do some more filming this week, as well as some scheduled trips with people that I've actually built relationships with over the years, and I'm looking forward to going fishing with them. Nice. So... Um, get, well, first of all, family time on the water is always necessary. It's never a bad time to be on the water. We had amazing weather this weekend, which is rare for us anyways. With like, I remember the last few years, it seems like every three, three day weekend, the weather was trash, yep. but, uh, we, we had a, a beauty, a beauty of a uh, Memorial day weekend. I did manage to get out a couple times this, this weekend, um, one of which was terrible. My son, I ask him sometimes when we have some weather windows or some time to fish it, what do you want to fish for? He goes, pickerel. I'm like, that's literally the worst call for this time of year that you could have made, but we will go catch pickerel. And then the trolling motor died because the battery wasn't fully charged and we were blowing down the pond and had a beat brush, get to the bank, lug the battery like a lot further than we had to. So that was an adventure. We caught some monster pickerel, which was cool. Um, but Goal accomplished. I, I was hoping he was going to say like stripers or, you know, something more appropriate for Memorial Day weekend. But um, we did that. I did get out uh, on Monday and do a little striper fishing in the rips, which was fun. It was blowing a thousand miles per hour, but caught plenty of fish. Um, so definitely a great Memorial Day weekend. So give me a little background on um, kind of what got you into fishing and then take me into, you know, what what that pivotal moment where it was like, I think I'm going to start a fishing company. That's a long story, but I'll try to like got put plenty it in. Of time. Yeah, we got about an hour. So, uh, you know, I'll tell like, so the first fishing experience I had with the saltwater, I think it was actually the first fishing experience I ever had was fishing in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. So my family used to rent uh, a house over at Chalker Beach. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up doing is my father came down and he's like, let's go fishing. And at this point, I was like seven years old, never fished a day in my life. And we walked what seemed like five miles, but at seven years old, it was probably a hundred yards to a jetty. <laughs> and we went to the local bait shop, whatever one that was in the local area, picked up some sandworms, grabbed a hook that was probably a freshwater hook. I mean, we're talking zero experience at yeah. this time. So your dad wasn't a big fisherman? No, okay. no, not at all. Like I have family members that are big fishermen, yep. but my father never really picked it up. Okay. So we walk out to the jetty and we're probably out there for like a half an hour. And all of a sudden the rod starts moving a little bit. Uh, he sets the hook and I'm all excited. Like, wow, we just got the, what, what's going on? I'm like, what's new? And he pulls up, well, at the time was an unidentified fish, a flat fish. At, you know, it wasn't even a fluke. It was a skate. Now that like okay. my, 
my experience has taken up. Like he didn't know if it was a stingray. He's like, don't touch it. That thing's going to sting you. <laughs> so that was my first experience with fishing. And what ended up happening with that was uh, it came back and I was living with my grandfather at the time. And my grandfather heard the stories about how excited I was. And that's all I talked about all week long, just going fishing again. And at the time, I was living in Wallingford, Connecticut. And my grandfather would watch me all summer, all summer long. We'd go to his house, my brother and I. And he's like, all right, it's Wednesday. Let's go fishing. I was like, sure, let's go. And he used to take us up to this reservoir called Mackenzie Reservoir. And it had two lakes to it with a divider, a, a, a cul-de-sac or a duck work that connected both the ponds. Okay. And I would sit up there every Wednesday from like 7 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock in the afternoon with night crawlers on the bottom, picking up sunfish, yellow perch, every once in a while a largemouth bass. And that's really where my identification of understanding how much I really enjoyed being on or near or fishing near water. Yeah. Like that's really where it took off. It's funny. It really doesn't take much. It doesn't, and it's it's addictive. Yep. It becomes part of you. Mm -hmm. And funny story, not to get off topic, but I was down in New London. There was a young kid yep. uh, throwing uh, a soft plastic. I don't know exactly which one it was. And he was out there casting away. This kid was probably like 9, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know where his parents were. His parents, he says he, li he lived local. And he was out there fishing. I started like picking his brain a little bit. And I like it kind of brought me back to this exact yeah. moment where – He's like, yeah, I come out here. He's like, dude, I just saw a fluke swimming by. He goes, it was huge. He goes, I casted everything at it, but it wanted nothing to do with it. I was like, oh, how long have you been fishing for? He was like, ever since I could remember. And I'm watching this kid cast, and at like nine years old, he's whipping this lure out there. He's looking behind them, make sure he's not hooking somebody. I was like, this kid's got some passion. Yeah. So I was like, listen, I'll make a deal with you. He goes, you, I go, you got Instagram? He goes, yeah. I go, follow us on Instagram, and I'll hook you up. He follows up on Instagram, and I gave him a swatter. Yeah. And then I just said, hey, thanks. Continue on with what you're doing. That's awesome. Because you could see the passion in yeah. the kids' eyes. So I was like, that's a future fisher. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's the future of, of what we're also passionate about. You need that. And uh, anytime you come across those instances, it, it is really special. And it does bring you back. That nostalgia of, of being that little kid at the end of a jetty growing up where it's like all your friends, are, they're playing sports, yeah. they're doing what they do. And it's like, you're that oh, he, this kid loves to fish. And then you end up bringing all your buddies into it. And it, it turns into to just a really enjoyable affliction or addiction. And uh, it, it, it gets in your blood. It stays with you forever. It's really a special deal that we're all uh, afflicted by. You could just tell by this young yeah, kid. He was just, great. he had the passion. So getting back into the story. So from there on out, I just love fishing. And, you know, I think fishing became a part of me that summer and the summers that followed with my grandfather taking me to, you know, Mackenzie Reservoir every once in a while to go blue crabbing or go catch yep. snapper blues off of Brantford. And, you know, obviously as I aged into my later teens, I might have fallen out of fishing a little bit, found some other interests. Because yep. you got to kind of get a little bit more diversification, some more culture in you. Sure. Whether it would be uh, hanging out with friends or whatever. You just come in and out of it. But at the end of the day, every single chapter – of my of my life so far, there's always been a couple of pages of fishing. Yeah, it's always been there. It's always been that that haven, that happy place, like, like Happy An Gilmore. Escape. Yeah, yeah, like Happy Gilmore. You see Happy Gilmore go to his happy place. You see his wife in a nice thing. The little guy <laughs> jumping on the head of the th of the thing. Chubbs has both both hands. Chubbs has both hands. There's a pitcher of beer, <laughs> yeah. and then. My happy place is you see a fishing pole, yeah, a net, and just some water in front of yeah. you. That it was really that's is. always been a happy place for me. So, so you you grew up with it in your life um, at an early age. W where was it? I mean, you, you're you went to business school, right? You're a marketing guy. Yeah, it took a while to get there. Yeah, so I started with a two year degree. Mm -hmm. uh, took a year off of high school, and I worked at, at Yulebrick Steel in Wallingford. All the guys there are like, dude, you got to go to school. Yeah. Like, there's something about you. You're like, sure. You got to go to school. So I listened to him. I went to school, uh, went to Gateway Community Technical. I think it's something called differently now. And then I went to Eastern Connecticut State University for three years. Didn't do too well there. So that was a chapter in my life that kind of just went downhill. Sure. 
you take some bullets, you know, you take some hits and you just got to rebuild yourself and it's okay to take a few hits. It's yeah. okay to fall on your face. It's okay to lose. Uh, so I took that as a learning experience and went into sales. Yeah. Built somewhat of a career path in sales early on. And then I ended up going back to school. I ended up going to uh, Southern Connecticut State University for yep. like three or four courses. And the reason I went back to Southern Connecticut State University is A, I was close to home. Yeah. I can commute. And B, I was a member of the North Italian Club, which is like, you know, those little home clubs where yep. a bunch of people get together. And they had this like pool or this raffle where you throw a dollar in a week and you get the, they pick a number. Mm -hmm. Well, I ended up winning that, and it was like for twenty three hundred bucks. So I did what any honorable person would do: you give two hundred to the bar, yep. one hundred and fifty to everyone at the bar, yep. and let it go as long as it can for everyone that comes in and has a drink. Fifty dollars to the bartender, and then my buddy Tom goes, "What are you going to do with the rest?" Because they were all like, "Just keep the money." You yep. like, you know, they knew my situation sure. at the time. I was like, "No, nah, I got to do that." So he's like, "What are you going to do?" I'm going to go back to school, and everyone just kind of was like. Oof. I don't know if you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> but as persistent as I am at certain things, I ended up going back to Southern Connecticut State University for a couple courses. And I did well. I think yep. I did shot 75% on the four courses that I did, which there was another failure in my life, which is fine. But I knew the end result was going to happen when I was 35 years old, where I went to Bridgewater State University. Uh, my wife really pushed me in that direction. My career path was tanking at that point because I didn't have a piece of paper. Yeah. So I ended up finishing it up, and that took me to where I was working full time and making bucktails, in and having a daughter, my daughter Catherine. Okay. So I was working, going to school full time, working full time, and making bucktails, and that's where I kind of, you know, Joe Bags kind of really took off. So it all started making bucktails as a side hustle, and, and then it, it just kind of led you in that direction from there? Well, there's a lot of failures in between sure. here and there, but it's the entrepreneurship, the canning ability that you could fish for so much, but the market can only bring you so much, and that's what I ran into. Uh, and what I mean by that is back in the day, you really only had a couple of places. You had local tackle shops, mm -hmm. some local manufacturers, and, you know, big box stores where you can get all your tackle from. The problem that I ran into is a lot of the fishing that I was doing required oversized hooks, different style paddle tails, and just a different look I was looking to kind of fish. And I wasn't able to find it anywhere. So that's where the bucktail really came in. We had Andres, which is a great bucktail, but the problem was I couldn't find them anywhere. Yeah. And if you did find them... They were picked through. They were, you know, everyone already, the bucktail craze was there. Everyone was picking through them. So that's really where the bullet bucktail with the eyes came in with the, a bunch of hair, that Rhode Island style bucktail. And I found a custom mold maker at the time. And I just said, all right, I'm going to spend X amount of dollars and get what I want. Mm -hmm. And I started building them. And then next thing you know, like I'd be fishing with my friends and I'd go look through my bucktail pouch at the end of the night. There'd be none there. They all took them all. I was like, ah, oh, you, little, you little sneaky friends there. So my friends got a little bit of, uh, they, they got a little taste of the early Joe bags with the bucktails. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, I'm working full time. I think at the time I was selling service contracts for fire alarm systems. Uh, I have my daughter, Catherine, who is probably at this time six months old. And I just be in a pouring lead till 12 o'clock at night in my shed because my wife was like, you're not keeping that in the house. Yeah. It's lead. And I respected that. Sure. Like, you don't want lead around your kids. It's You don't want to be smelting with all those fumes <laughs> going. So here I am lugging like 200 feet of electrical cord from a power source. <laughs> to my shed every single night, pouring bucktails, and then cleaning them down there, bringing them back into the basement, and powder painting. Next thing you know, I'm putting eyes in them. I'm tying bucktails. I'm sourcing where I can get all the materials from. And, you know, I had to learn everything, like learning everything. 
where to get the bucktail, where to get the thread, where to find lead, because lead is actually a challenge to find it in sure. horrible, small pieces. And, you know, finding the right powder paint, you know, everyone can go to all the major ones, but, you know, those can be a little pricey at the point. Sure. When you're starting off on your own, you kind of got to take a little risk versus reward. Yeah. You have to be able to, you know, take some risk, find the right stuff for you. So you, I found the powder paint that worked well with me. Uh, I, then the problem was finding glue. Yeah. You had to find the right glue because, well, let's be honest, eyes are not going to stay in anything. You're, you're throwing especially it in water, yeah. you're, especially a bucktail. You're bouncing it on water, bouncing it on the bottom. Like if you get eyes to stick, if you get one of the two eyes to last all night, that's actually a good trip yeah. from my experience. Yeah, or you weren't fishing it right. Or you weren't fishing it right. <laughs> so that was like, that was all taking place between the hours of 6 p.m. and 12 p.m., yeah. Monday through Sunday. Just straight grinding. Just straight grinding. And then the internet got a hold of it. People started talking about the Joe bags. And at this point, I was just a small guy in my shed, in my basement. Yeah. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just making buck down. She's like, for who? You do this every night. I'm like... I go, look, I go, I have all these small little orders that, you know, the community wants and yeah. I'm, I'm trying to fill that. She's like, all right, cool. Keep doing it. We're going away on a vacation every once in a while now. Like the money wasn't there, but we yeah. were like, we were comfortable, but we weren't like, this was actually helping out so sure. much. And the intent at this point was, and the conversations I had with my wife was, this is for our college, our daughter's college. And I only had one daughter at the time. And I started saving that money and yep. I would reinvest it. So it became not part of our everyday spending, which I think really helped mm -hmm. build the Joe bags uh, in the beginning yep. because I didn't spend that money. It was a saved nest egg, but I did reinvest it back into the business. And that worked out well for like a year or two. And then all of a sudden shops really wanted to get a piece of get some joe bags in there because they're they're people were coming in looking for you know bucktails yeah and i was like all right cool we could do this sure packaging <laughs> i had to learn packaging i've never done any merchandising before a day in my life and it was terrible it was so terrible i'm surprised they even still wanted to do business with yeah. me and I had to source all this packaging. So I'm on the internet now for hours trying to find a company that does bagging. And you get one bag, you're like, oh, that's cool. Then all of a sudden, the bottom would blow out on it. And you'd be like, dude, this thing can't hold three ounces of lead because I'm living in Massachusetts and these bucktails are three to five ounces. Yeah. So there, were, there was an entire learning curve on packaging, what you're going to do with it. So I found packaging to be the hardest challenge of the entire – I still find it to be a challenge. Yeah. Uh, because we've developed so much along the way. So next thing you know, I ended up losing that job at Simplex here now, mm -hmm. right? And my wife's like, Joe, you got to make a choice what you want to do. Like, you got to find out what you're happy at. Yeah. And I'm thankful to have her because she really pushed me in the direction of going Joe Bags because I come from a working class family. Sure. Like you work for the man and you know, you constantly work. You don't, you, do. you don't go off on your own. It's what you do, yeah. you know? And she's like, I'll be honest with you. She goes, you're good at sales. You're good, but you don't love it. Yeah. Like you don't love what you're doing. And I said, okay. She goes, but you love fishing and your bucktails are doing okay. She goes, why don't you take a year and see what you could do? <laughs> so I went hard. I went really hard. And I remember that first year because everything was on my shoulders. Yeah. But at this point, a lot of pressure. At this point, talk about pressure. At this point, I had my second daughter. Oh, had my second daughter now. Stakes just just got higher. Well, a lot higher. Yeah, kids by, eat. By kids twice. eat. By twice. twice. Yeah, I, by double. Double in it. So now I have a lot of pressure on me. So I just pounded the ground. I went to New Jersey. Yeah. I went to New York. I went to Long Island, which is part of New York. So you, you, you leaned on your sales background to go and sell yourself now, right? Yeah. I just went for it. Yeah. I did all the shows. I put myself out there. You know, I, I put myself out on the internet. You know, you know how the internet sure. is. It's, it's positive and you're going to get the other side yeah, of it. Yeah, of course. It is what it is. So 
I grinded this out for a year. And then we came out with the SPJ, yep. which is our soft plastic jig heads with a double collar. And that's still a staple in a lot of anglers bags today. Yep. So I'm bringing two products to the market at this point, two custom products that is new. It's a new look. Bucktail's been around. Yeah, sure. Jig heads have been around, but it's a new design and a new look. So let me uh, let's back up a little bit. So you're doing this um, in your after hours from working a full time sales job. At that stage, working from six p.m. to midnight, how many bucktails could you pump out in in a week or a night? I know it's a process, but like let's call it a week. We're going back years now. We're going yeah, back like, like if you were to years. guess, uh, I would say in the beginning, yeah, I could probably pump out ten and ten an hour. Okay, and that was just tying. Yeah. Uh, by the end of it, at its peak, I was probably doing 35, 40 yep. an hour. Once you got the hang of it all. And and that was still in those, you know, confined, you know, 6 p.m. to, to 12 p.m. type deal. This space is what I was working Yeah, in. sure. Because when I worked in copiers, mm -hmm. they told me that when the, the copiers were imported from Japan or China, wherever they were yep. made, the space that they worked in to build these photocopiers, yep. the ones that you guys probably have upstairs yep. in our normal businesses. Sure. It was eight feet long. Wow. So you, people didn't waste time going to get parts. Everything was there. Everything was right at our Everything's reach. right there. So I took that advice from that previous employment that I had yeah. and worked like that. So everything I still do today yeah. is within the smallest confined space so that I can maximize time. So then now, now you're full-time doing this. How did that change? How did that scale your production capabilities? Just still as a one-man band. Yeah. It went from... What, what did we, you said you could do 60 in a night? I could do, I could, I probably started off at like 10 to 12 an hour and I yep. can do probably up to like 30 to 40 an hour if yep. they were a single color buck. Sure. Uh, but you also have to remember there's a step before that. So that is just a tying aspect. Yep. So you have to melt the lead. You, so you have cutting it up into places, you're putting it into a 20 to a 50 pound melting pot. Now you have to pour it. So yep. now you're pouring 200 bucktails in half to five ounce. You're trying to get 200 of each so you could just have the stock. Yep. So the way I built a business was in steps. Mm -hmm. So the tying was kind of like the second to last step. So the first step was sourcing lead, melting it, and getting your bare jig heads yep. ready to go for the powder painting or if they were just a bare, if like they were like the SPJ, they would just be bare or white, mm -hmm. right? So then you'd have to powder paint them. So I'd be powder painting whatever the orders were, plus some, because you want to have some extra stock. So when something comes up or somebody wants to add, that's a whole different beast of its own to learn. Sure. But you kind of get a gist yep. of the way, once you've done it long enough, you kind of understand where you're, what you need. Then the powder painting. So it yep. would be an entire process of, I could probably powder paint 100 jigs an hour, yep. maybe maybe 200, depending on how I, how I set them up. And that got better over time. I could probably do up to 300 an hour now because I still do powder paint all, all of our Patriot Fish jigs and our SPJ still. Uh, then the eye process, that was time consuming. You yeah. have to put in eyes double time, right? One side down. So you're laying them all out completely like as close together as you possibly can so you can maximize the tight space that you have. And then you'd let those dry. And then you'd flip them. And then you'd do the other side. I still do that today. And then you'd start the tying process. So bucktails were very time consuming to make. And then you'd have to deal, deal with the packaging. Yeah. And then you'd ship them and then you'd do all the invoicing and everything. That's a, a laborious process, especially when you're, when you're literally figuring it out step by step on your own. So now jumped into how did you end up scaling the business across like all the, you know, all these new products and all that stuff. Like take us kind of through that a little bit. So like I said, a Bucktail, SPJ were really the beginning of mm -hmm. Joe Bags. I believe the next pro product was the Patriot Fish. So if you took a look at who I was servicing, the canal shops, right? Yep. Everything is around the canal is soft plastic. So I needed to take the SPJ jig head, that style, because it does work really well with plastics and really build a body around that particular style head. So we came up with the Patriot Fish, and that's a long, narrow bait. And it comes in three different three different lengths, but they're multiple to sizes from half ounce to five ounce. And I was like, all right, this is cool. And those sold very well. And, you know, right now the Patriot Fish 
from beach rock points, the canal, the block Island yeah. is a very popular bait here in the Northeast. Then we built the freedom fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been an evolutionary scale to the freedom fish because the market changes. Mm -hmm. And when you're in this industry, the market's going to change on you one way or another. You have to be able to adjust to make sure that you're meeting the demands of your people because you build an audience after a while. You build a following and they're like, hey, can you do this? And you're like, yeah, we're going to work towards that. Then the swatter came around, which is a hard plastic. Uh, We started off with the original, made a lot of modifications to it, changed it up a little bit. And... Between last year and this year, it's really taken off. Yeah. It's a real popular plug now. I think what ended up happening- And that's just, that's a minnow plug. It's a minnow plug. Yep. Yep. It's a, it's a minnow plug. It has its place. A lot of positive feedback on yep. it. So as long as people are throwing it, they're catching, which I'm happy about. And then we got into the resin jig market. Uh, we built and scaled an entire product line geared around Albies, yep. tuna, sea bass, and let's be honest, you you know the resin jig pretty much catches every fish mm-hmm. in the ocean. Uh, and we really just scaled the business based on the fishing that I was picking up. So if I was getting into fluke, I wanted to get it, I wanted to build a fluke jig. Yeah. If I wanted to fish for albies, I wanted to build a jig that was specific for what I wanted. Yep. If I wanted to fish for tog, I wanted to fish a jig that was specific for me. This this whole evolution of building out your product line, it's pretty cool that, that it literally is dictated by the fishery that you know intimately, that you spend the most time targeting. So it's literally, you know, nor, a Northeast tackle company building products for the species that we're all passionately chasing. Exactly. So I always felt like whatever was on the market is great. That's somebody sure. else's idea, right? Everyone has their own yep. way of fishing. It's their own idea. I have a specific way that I enjoy fishing, and I think everyone does. Yep. This is where I could take my thoughts, my inner thoughts, my designs, and apply them to the fishing that was important to me. Yep. Or here in the Northeast, we have a lot of seasons. so Very, we, very versatile, dynamic fishery. I mean, it's probably, you know, has some of the most variety of, of maybe any fishery. I fish down in florida i fish a lot of other places we do have the best fishery yeah that i have seen everywhere i mean florida is great they they, they're great and i I love that they have tarpon sure they don't have what we have up here yeah we can they don't have that cyclical nature to everything sure there's times when the tarpon bites best or when the snook bite is best but it's not like you know they're getting an influx of an entirely different type of species you know, five, six, seven times over the course of the year like we have. It's very seasonal. It's it's pretty awesome. It, we have yeah. the best fishery in America. I love it. I'll say it. Yep. The Northeast kicks ass. It does. If anybody is listening to this podcast and listening to On the Water and you want to really experience a fishery like no other, you've got to visit the Northeast. Yeah. We really do have the best fishery it's you'll special. ever see because every time you go out there's always an opportunity you're not getting you're not baiting fish behind the boat yeah hoping for what is it yelltail that they got down there sure you're not doing that i mean that's cool it's new to us yeah but at the end of the day you're catching fluke sea bass tog striper shark tuna miles offshore yeah and then you get all your ground fish it's it's a special deal we have going on it's lock and load yeah. is what it really comes down to. And it's and it's kind of cool that it's it's condensed for the most part in like, you know, uh, what, a seven-month seven, seven month stretch where it's like, y- you know, you get that buildup, that excitement. And then you get those little mini spikes within the season where it's like, oh, man, the stripers are on their way. They're here. This is awesome. And it's like game on. And, and we, you know, have these fish for the entire summer into the fall. But within that, it's like next up here come our pelagics and it's like where am i gonna what am i gonna go to the canyons where i can catch all these trucks like i went looking for a blue marlin like you know most of my teen years into through my 20s you know into into my 30s and it was like kona on my honeymoon i'm gonna i'm gonna get some some marlin trips in saint lucia like i want you know costa rica i wanted a marlin bad where did he think I caught my marlin? Right off Massachusetts. Right in my own backyard, leaving out of Falmouth, Massachusetts. You know, I get a 350-pound mar- uh, marlin, blue marlin, to the back of the boat, and it's like, 
really my own backyard yep that's how special this 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 fishery really is it's just you never know they're out there yeah find that 80 degree water you're good oh, to go yeah. and, they, and they're usually bigger a yeah. lot of the, a lot of the marlin guys that travel the world will tell you that like the northeast canyons just the, just the they they hold the biggest marlin the biggest wahoo it's you well, know, we have. they're not common i mean they they are they're there but you get the bigger class of fish where it's weird inshore it with some of those you know summer visitors like uh king mackerel for instance yep. right they tend to be on the smaller side of things you know our state record in massachusetts here is like chris tied it one year it was like it's like 11 pounds or something like that when you know these fish grow to 40 pounds so it's like the antithesis inshore but yeah but they're running those fish yeah. are running but we have the bait yeah offshore we have the bait yeah so those fish are going to tend to be bigger out there. So, so I mean, that, going back to the business, it's got to give you kind of a, a, a local competitive advantage because you're so in tune with what's going on in the Northeast and you're building products for specifically the Northeast fishery. So that has to give you kind of like a leg up because you're so, you know, zeroed in and dialed in on this fishery that you got to imagine that that brings to market something that these massive global companies – you know, they can't do it at that, you know, dialed in scale because they're trying to be everything to everyone, right? Correct. So that is a local competitive advantage, right? Yeah. But, you know, I see it from New Jersey to Maine. Yeah. Like that is really my wheelhouse. Sure. I mean, don't get me wrong. We do get sales in Texas. We do have a small market in California. We do have some market down in Florida, but not much. Yeah, but that speaks to the versatility of the Northeast fishery. I mean, we see it in our business. We started here on Cape Cod and kind of grew out, and our wheelhouse is the same as you just mentioned, maybe a little further, you know, mirroring the, uh, the my, you know, the home front of the striped bass, Virginia to Maine, let's call it, right? That was brilliant, by the way. And yeah, it's like, that's that's the poster child of our media group. And behind that, the next one in, in is the bluefin tuna. So yep. it, it's funny how you focus on that, you do that really well. The other stuff comes. I mean, you look at our, our on our Google Analytics, it's like California, Texas, Florida. These are all states that rank in our top 10, you yep. know, that are, that are consuming our media. And it's because of that... Um, that crossover between some of the species we 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 fish for or cover or write about the mahi, the tunas, the pelagics, like all that stuff is available, you know, in much of the globe's waters. So that stuff, we post something about a swordfish, which you know we have them right here in our canyons. It's a great fishery. You hear from New Zealand. It, that stuff happens organically. So you must have seen that with some of the crossover of, all the time. You know your imitations that. You know, they're going to match bait fish in other places of the world. And next thing you know, someone stumbles across it. And it's like, wow, this is a perfect myth. So when you take a look at the Google Analytics, yeah. I love seeing people from California, Texas, Alaska. Like you could see where these viewers are coming from mm -hmm. and as they grow. Yeah. I love those viewers, by the way, mm -hmm. because you know why? They are so in tune in a species. So you yeah. brought up a valid point. So you said bluefin. Mm -hmm. Bluefin are across the world. Yeah. So you have anglers out there that are looking and studying bluefin. And they're like, where am I going to go catch my next bluefin? Or what is the bluefin like in New England versus over in Europe? Yeah. And they're learning that species. And yeah. those anglers that are sourcing that our information, your information, my information – are the best viewers ever because they are so in tuned into the fishing industry. Sure. They're sharing that information. They're probably the most advanced anglers learning. They're yeah. absorbing information from everywhere. It's fun to see those crossovers take place from like West Coast to, to East Coast, even with Bluefin specifically. It's like the West Coast guys, they fish them a certain way. Next thing you know, you know, they come out here for a trip or something like that, or they, you know, start following something like what we're, you know, publishing and how we you know, fish for bluefin and stuff, and they bring it and apply it to to their backyard, and they're like, wow, this, this gives me a different look to show these fish, and it, and it usually gives you good results. It does give good yeah. results. When you're able to, I always look at it as like, surround yourself by good people mm -hmm. or people like that are different Absolutely. than you so that you could absorb information from them to make you a better person. Same thing with the fishing. Yeah. You see a lure that works out here in the Northeast. Oh, let me let me go ahead and pick that up yeah. and apply it to here. Now you're the only guy on the boat catching. Mm -hmm. And then everyone's like, what are you doing? And then all of a sudden you're like, you're the boss. Yeah. Like you're the man. You yeah, thought about cool it. You're bringing it to you. Like there's nothing better than that feeling. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. So um, 
We talked about some of the soft plastics using your local, you know, network, if you will. Um, we, we've seen this, this, you know, ebb and flow of soft plastics, specifically for striper fishing, kind of, you know, get to craze level. And then it kind of goes away for a little bit, tapers off. Those guys that, that you know, fish a lot of soft plastics still have their, you know, it still has a spot in their, in their arsenal. And then it comes back full swing again. I think we're in one of those full on soft plastic, you know, crazes right now. So how did, how did you take, you know, your knowledge of the fishery and kind of partner with people that were catching giant striped bass in places like Block Island that wanted something a little bit more easy, accessible than dealing with eels on a, on a regular basis? Like how did that, how did that process kind of play out within your business? So it's about, it's about question. So one of the things I've always looked for is does an angler meet our culture, right? So I have a certain culture. I want to, I'm an angler. Mm -hmm. I respect our fishery. Uh, I actually care about our fishery a lot. And I look for anglers or captains that have the same mentality. Like they're going to keep their fish. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. But at the end of the day, they love our fishery. So one of the things I do is I look for guys that are constantly fishing, have the passion for fishing and, want to excel at fishing and you know our plastics really took off with the patriot fish and then joe diorio really took it off on the block island side of things and he really started fishing our gear because he is a big soft plastics guy out there with our jig heads the mm -hmm. spj and we got to talk and he's like you got to make a bigger patriot fish so we did we did the 12.5 and he's like you got to do an eel i was like all right i'll do an eel and then we came out with the four 14.5 inch eel and they've been working great for him and yeah. for all everyone else that's going out there so when that pro, when that starts when you start making those inroads with these really fishy dudes that care and that are super passionate and are, i mean you mentioned diorio one of the best striper guys in in that in that region we've, Absolutely. we've done a lot with him um and he catches a lot of big fish so how did do, do you guys kind of look at it as a collaboration or is it more of like a hey i have this need that I really haven't found a fit for, you know, what do you think about this? And then you turn it around in your head and it's like, all right, I, I would do it this way. So Joe is a special teammate of ours, mm -hmm. right? I, I get along really well with Joe. Joe comes out on the boat, on the on, on my boat, the 240 Cobia, and we try to fish at least two or three times a year, you know, in and around his season. Mm -hmm. So we got out this spring a little bit, but we're also looking to get out in the fall. And I value Joe's opinions because Joe's been a fishy dude. He's, he's as yeah. salty as they come right? And he fishes top waters really well. So the, a lot of my feedback from the original skipper was mm -hmm. from Joe DiOrio. Uh, all my feedback from the eels and the Block Island Patriot fish is from Joe because I value his opinion out there because he's out there every day doing it. Sure. And he's a straight shooter. Yeah. And that's what I look for. I don't need a guy that's going to be you like... You can't have a guy that's going to sugarcoat stuff or tell you, hey, this is great, and then be like... Mm. I'm not really too high on this because then you go down that, you know, dead end road. Um, so that, that feed, that honest feedback has, has to be as valuable oh, as anything. In trust me. He loves giving me honest feedback. Yeah. I mean, sometimes he might take it a little too far and I have to put him back in his place. But I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's like, dude, you're going yeah. a little too far on that. So, so you mentioned the skipper, that's a top water kind of walk the dog slash slash bait, if you will. Right. From what I've seen, that's kind of how it's action kind of shows on film. Anyways, I haven't fished one yet. Um, you will. I know I will. Um, there, uh, I loved. I mean, who doesn't love top water? So, like, how did when when you first came out with it? What what was? How did that, you know, play out in your mind that that led you to the determination? Like, hey, this could be better. How am I, how am I going to get there? Like, how did that play out? So, getting back to what we were talking about before the evolution of Joe Bags's product line. Yeah. Right. So, I took a look at my product line. So, I had jig heads. I had plastics, I have resin jigs, I had fluke stuff, I had sea bass covered, uh, I had a minnow plug, Yeah. and then I'm taking a look at the industry in the Northeast, and always in the spring and always in late fall, there's always a great topwater bite. Mm -hmm. There's uh, up and down the eastern seaboard, yeah. everyone's like, oh, you got to get on that topwater bite, because it's exciting. Captains are taking out their anglers, their little two and three pack charters, they're throwing out their topwater, they're getting an explosion, that gets people excited. And I was like... I'm kind of dead in the water with this. I don't have anything. I'm using competitors, which are fine. I love the I love the products. That, mm -hmm. I mean, it was there, but I had to come up with something that was Joe Bags. Mm -hmm. And 
so that's when the skipper came around and I came out with the first original skipper and I'll be honest, it sucked. Yeah. I mean, I caught fish on it, but I'm also a fisherman. Sure. And I think if you're going to do top water, it needs to be simple, stupid. Yeah, that's that's a big deal. I mean, you see a lot of baits where the right guy with that bait in his hand, it's deadly, but you put it in the hand of the 85% and they're going to make up most of the market. It's not going to catch anything for them. And then they're going to just <laughs> turn to the internet and be like, this thing sucks. Yeah. You know? So there's, there's got to be a, a line that you have to walk there that keeps something like a topwater bait where it's up to the angler to impart the action to catch fish where you can do certain things to make that a little easier for, you know, maybe the newer people in the sport or the people that don't have the time to really get dialed in. So I took a look at the market, yep. right? And obviously, I'll even mention it. The dock is the boss, mm -hmm. right? But the dock, it casts decent. But I don't see many surf casters using a dock. Like, I just don't hear about, oh, I threw it a dock and I got a bunch of fish. Sure. Like, they're using it in, when the fish aren't close, but yep. they're not getting the distance out of it. So I was, I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, all right, I don't want to knock off the dock because that's not really my culture. Mm -hmm. But I, I do have to come out with a topwater lure. And it has to be a walk to dog because the poppers are all taken. Sure. There's not really many designs I can come out with a popper at the moment that I can't become close and have to hear about it. Yeah. I mean, I'll have to eventually, but right now my focus was on the walk to dog. And I'm like, all right, so why can't I do like a walk to dog pencil popper style? So kind of like a hybrid. Yeah, like a hybrid. And then, but also have it meet that 85% of the market, which is basically surf casters, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, I got to come up with a walk the dog pencil popper style bait that's around three ounces that surf casters can get the distance on and still have the same top water explosions as, say, the dock does. Yeah. And that's where the skipper came around. Sure. So the first generation I had to scrap. I wasn't happy with it. So then I, I started taking a look at a what lot of What didn't you like about it? Ease of use. Yeah. Like, I'm a salty guy. Yeah. I could fish it. I caught a bunch of fish. I caught a bunch of 30 pounders on the thing. Yeah. It's big bait, big profile. If it's worked right, it's going to catch fish. But it was, it was. You picked up that it was. It took some finesse to get to work the way that was going to draw those strikes, right? I gave those to a lot of top anglers, and they're like, these are salty dudes, right? Yep. These are fishy guys, and they love it. Mm -hmm. They do. You know who doesn't love it? Joe. He yep. hated it. He loved telling me about it, too. He's like, dude. Well, he's also a charter guy. He has people from all different walks of life getting on his boat. Some of which have never worked a. a, a of you know walk the dog style bait so there's got to be something to that right well that goes back to the ease of use factor yeah right so you have to have something that's ease of use so i redesigned it and i made the bottom of the skipper more flat mm -hmm. so it can glide across the top of the water so it gives a wider profile as if you if you get a chance and you're listening to this podcast afterwards go to our go to our youtube go to our instagram and see what the skipper does on top yeah so it goes has a nice wide to wide but you can also work it like a pencil popper so when those fish are not really active and you need that extra noise or that extra speed, you can work it like a pencil popper, then slow it down mm -hmm. to get that nice slow side to side action, that walk to dog to really trigger that fish. So there's a lot of work that can be done in between to entice a fish to strike because not all bass are going to react the same way every single day and throughout the day. So early on, you might get them to hit that walk to dog yep. slow and steady. But as the, the sun light, gets high, sun gets high yeah. you might need to create a little bit more splash, a little bit more speed to get that I, instant reaction. I out think of those it. bites that come in the high, the highlight, um, you know, those bluebird days, those are just anger bites. Yeah. I, don't, I don't, you know, I mean, they'll still eat a top water, but why? It's because it's probably pissing them off. It's yeah. Or it's, it's looking easy or it's like, oh, I might as well. I'm not, I don't know when the next school bunker is going to come by. But it gives you that versatility throughout this plug to catch fish and to yep. be able to work it and to entice them. Because I think as an angler, everyone just wants to cast out and reel in. Yep. There's a little bit more in between those stages because what I've realized is over my time is just because you're casting out and reeling in, you might catch one or two. But your buddy caught six or seven. Yep. So what did he do? Did he jig? Did he pop it off the bottom three times and pause and then let it hit the bottom again? Did he hit the bottom and yoke it up and then just start reeling? Like, it's okay to take a look at your neighbor that's catching. Sure. And follow what they're doing and try different things. And now what I mean by try different things, it doesn't mean 
you try one thing and you give up and you go to the next thing. You got to, all right, I'm going to try this method forecast. There's so many different ways to retrieve. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at some, I mean, a straight paddle tail, right? That thing is fishing just on a straight retrieve. But a lot of times it's those little rod trips, those little bounces that you give it. A little that, pause. Yeah. A little, a little drop, you know, something that changes. Cause you know, when you're, when you're bass fishing on a bass boat and you're throwing spinner baits or something like that, or a chatter bait or something like you, you'll get a lot of follows and there's something you could have done along the way to trigger that reaction yeah. to get that bite. And I think that's really what separates a lot of the guys that catch a lot of fish from the ones that, that maybe, you know, get a lot of follows. But right? I also think that's what keeps anglers coming back yep. though, too. It's that learning curve because let's be honest, fishing is not a hard sport to learn. It's just time on the water. And you got to break comfort. I think if you want to become better at anything, yep. anything you do, you have to break the comfort zone. You have to go outside of the box, no matter how much it painstakingly like allows you to, your body tells you Trial not to do it. Trial and error is a painful process, man. It is. It's not easy. We're not, I don't think humans are actually built to be trial and error. Yeah. Like it takes a special type we, of individual. Oh, especially in this day and age, you want instant gratification yeah. at all times. I mean, um, that's just where, where, where we've gone as a, as a society. It's I love like, failure. Yeah. I love failure. I, I, I don't mind failure. Failure is something that has always been a part of my life. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to fail again. I'm probably going to fail today. I'll probably fail tomorrow, but it's how you rebound from that failure. And like, just Amen. because you got skunked yep. that day, we can point the finger at everything else. That's, but at the end of the day, I take ownership. I'm yep. like, that was my, I could have made a different decision. That's what's awesome about fishing. The fact that, I mean, I've been fishing now for 38 years of my 40 years on this earth. And there isn't a day that, that I spend fishing where I don't learn something new. I don't, something doesn't click in my head where it's like, oh, I never picked up on that before. And that's what, re I think that's what's so special about fishing is because it never can get old because there's always something new to learn. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, the best. I think the worst failure is when you're driving home and you're like, and you thought about it. Yeah. And you're like, that's what would have made the difference you're there and those fish aren't biting you're like oh, and you're on the spot you got a little pressure on your yep. shoulders because i bring a lot of people out a lot of surf casters out with me a lot of my team members and i'm not a charter captain i don't ever sure. I, I don't have but that. you feel that pressure because you're oh. the guy you're running the boat and you know whenever i was in that th that situation people would look at you like all right i'm, I'm going fishing with cheech like we're gonna we're gonna mug them we're gonna have an amazing day and it's like man these expectations <laughs> suck but yes that's I a feel capital that e yeah. in front of the expectations oh, with an exclamation yeah. point at the end of it and you want to deliver so bad and it's the it's the most unsettling feeling when it's like you can't do anything right that day so recent story right so i go out fishing with jared uh my buddy jared and i'm like i just text him i'm like you want to go fishing tonight yeah. he's like hell yeah this guy fishes all the time we go out it's nighttime I'm driving around Narragansett Bay. I go to a few spots. I spotted, I scouted like two days before. I'm like, oh, these fish are staging there. If it's cool. anything like last year, we're going to bang them up. We get out there. It's a friggin' ghost town. <laughs> I mean, I marked three fish. I was like, oof. I was like, all right. So we're driving around again. And I go to the other spot that I had them stacked and loaded two days prior. Nobody home. Literally, ghost town. And then at this point, I had my squid rod. I looked at him, I go, you want to go squidding? He goes, no. I was like, damn, my expectation is really high on this one because I told him we're going to sure. bail fish tonight. And uh, I might have I spoke a little too soon on that. So I was like, all right, fine. So I go around, go to Beaver Tail, nothing, goes down. I'm like, this is dismal. I go up the bay. I go to like... I forget the name of the point over there. And I'm like, this is a ghost town too. And I look at it and I go, should have just went squid fishing. Next thing you know, we go to the last spot. I go, we're going to try this last spot. He goes, all right, at this point. Probably the spot that you thought least of. No, it was actually one of my first ones. But oh, I was okay. like, I was kind of curious on what was going on around me. Sure. It's always like my fallback. Yeah, yeah. But I was like, dude, it, all the other spots were there. This place is probably going to be like maybe one fish, two fish. We get there. It's lock and load. <laughs> he bangs. Like At this point, I'm just frustrated. And he's looking at me. He goes, dude, I got another one on. Another one. And these fish are all like probably 24 to 36 inches. Sure. Every cast with a swatter in, in awesome. the light. And then finally I get into it and I bang a 30 pounder. 
That's... He's like, really? He goes, I go, you got the numbers today. I go, I just had to sneak in for the 30. Real yeah, quick. yeah, exactly. I go, you called them all for me. And we were laughing about that. That's but awesome. It's like, you just, the expectation, yeah. because you could tell the mood of people on the boat, right? You could, you could see it. It's like, oh, the expectation is high when you start. Yeah. Everyone's happy. You go to the first spot, nothing there. They can handle it. The second spot, it's usually just between the second and third location. You start to start seeing the, the wheels turning on, on the individuals. Sure. And you're just like, all right, now the expectation's there. Now yeah. the pressure builds. Yeah, it's the worst. Now you're, a guy, now, now you're no longer a friend. You're a guy. You're yeah. like, dude, I got to yeah. do this. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, it's um, I, that's why I, I love I love experiencing new fishing situations because there are no expectations. It's like let's just go see if we can figure this out, and and then you're starting from scratch. So it's when you when you have success, it's like wow, I didn't expect that. That's awesome. And then you just, just kind of build on that and file something away, pick up on this, and you start to piece it together. It's it's a real gratifying you know, process that plays out when you're doing something that's totally new. I think the lowest expectations, this is why I like going for tuna. I was just going to, just going to segue. I, I wanted to lead in there before you got there. I knew where your head was going. Yeah. Uh, but I, that's why I like tuna fishing because the expectation is always with guys that, are, that are come on the boat. Like sure. we know we're not going to catch anything, Yeah. but our goal is to catch something. Because it's not easy. There's a lot of water out there. I, it, it's an endless ocean, and uh, you, you're looking literally for the proverbial needle in a haystack. Tuna fishing, offshore fishing, it's it's all the same. You can go in a direction that is so far from where the fish are feeding that you're not going to see any life that day, and it, it, that's it. Could be challenging, yeah. but the expectation is so low. Yeah. But the gratification, oh, it's the, best. the adrenaline. The dilation of your pupils. Yeah. Like, and you hook up and your buddy hooks up and then everyone's on the same page. And yeah. if they're not on the same page, they quickly get on the Zero same page. Zero to 60 real fast on, yes. uh, on a tuna bite happening. Um, so we, you, you had reached out a few times. Um, was it last year or two years? It was, it was last year. Last year and, and the year before, I think, you got in on uh, a yellowfin bite um, that, that was pretty insane. How'd that, how'd that come up? Like, how did you, how did you get into you know, chasing yellowfin and you were fishing on your boat, right? Yeah. I was fishing on the, on the 240 Cobia. Uh, and you know, I heard some rumors like, cause there's always like rumors sure. around the Marina, like, Oh yeah, there was some yellowfin out in there. Close. Like in, in close. where you usually find bluefin and, and stuff. And yeah, seven miles from where you normally find bluefin. Yeah. You could still see the windmills. Yeah. And I was like, wait, wait what'd I you make it? I, I can like, make that. I was like, I don't, not only could I make that, what did you just say? Yeah. Because when you have a, a smaller size vessel, yep. you're limited to range. Like sure. I could probably get to the lanes, yep. but it's kind of nerve wracking. Yeah. I could probably get to the southeast corner of the dump, on the southwest corner of the dump yep. safely, right? Into the lanes. Because the the Cobia, the 240 Cobia holds 125 gallons of, of fuel. So that, you know, if you bust it out around about 1.9, 1.9 uh, 1. 9, 1. per gallon, you could probably do roughly around 240 with some reserve. Cool. So I'm like, wait, what did you say at the <sighs> marina? I was like, oh, there's yellowfin. I was like, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go do this. So I put together a crew. I was like, guys, there's yellowfin in close. They're like, how do you know that? I'm like, I just know. I heard it. Grapevine, old school style. Yeah. Let's go. They're like, let's go. So we go out there. And obviously there were a few boats, but the fleet hadn't hit it yet. Sure. There was just probably like six or seven boats out there. And at this po point, I'm buddying up with Joe DiOrio because mm -hmm. he's over, he's, he's heading towards uh, New York and I'm heading out towards like Suffolk, right? Sure. And then next thing you know, I'm like, we come back in and he's like, how'd you do? He's like, oh, I got a blue fit. I'm like, dude, we got like three yellows. And I'm like, the bite was sick. I'm like, it, Top water? It was sick. Everyone there. So when we got to the, the first day we were out there, everyone is jigging. There wasn't anybody throwing poppers. Okay. There was not a popper being thrown. We started throwing poppers. Because when you research yellowfin and the bite that you have, you take a look at the south shore of Long Island, sure. you take a look at New Jersey, and you start reading what worked well for them. And all of a sudden, I was just like, put on a popper. So we threw on a popper, and boom, we're tight. Were you marking fish? Not really. Yeah. We were marking. So what we were seeing, we were seeing a lot of dolphins. Okay. And the whale pods. Yep. So the first time we went out there, the, do the tuna were on whales. Okay. They were not on the dolphin, which yep. was kind of odd. Yeah, it seems like that side, the south side, 
Dolphins are, are good. Whales too. Any life is good. Any but, life is good. But when you see whale, when you see dolphins, like in the Stellwagen area, I've never caught tuna off them. Like ever. I it's hear always that. been on whales. It's it's very weird. And then all of a sudden it turns over down here. Like we, we ran kind of those same waters and uh, see dolphins and it's like, oh, it's game time. Let's go get the jigs down, get the, st- get the stick baits into the dolphins. And it was just lights out like one tuner after the n- another. So uh, my theory on that, and I, th- I tuna probably follow the dolphin because they know they're, they've been around them. They yeah. know that they have sonar. They know that they're more likely to find bait quicker or yep. food quicker. So the yellowfin and the bluefin are going to chase the dolphin. I don't know who's smarter in that equation, the bluefin or the dolphin. I don't know. But I know I know dolphin have echo sonar. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to follow dolphin if I'm yeah. starving. And especially if you're coming in close because what, do you, what if you're used to lanes and out further yeah and you're coming in close you're gonna follow dolphins in sure because they're gonna be the first ones to find bait so i think that's what brought them in and the blue water out yep. there that we had a nice eddy that pushed off and when those dolphin are circling there is no better adrenaline and then you see them go under and then up and then they're circling and they're putting those sand eels and then next thing you know you see the butterfish jumping out of the water and we don't have the bird problem as like you guys do yeah. on the cape those guys, I love those birds. I love the sounds they do, but they are a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We don't have that, so it's just straight throwing poppers, throwing jigs. Yep, and just watching eighty pound yellowfin come up and smash them. That's that's unbelievable. I mean, I've caught most of my yellowfin, you know, out in the canyons on the trolling stuff. So to be able to go and jig and pop them is pretty awesome. Like, um, I wanted to get on that bite so bad, it just never kind of panned out schedule wise. But um, we, I remember. Um, my wife's boss at the time, he, he's got a big center console and he loves to fluke fish. So I love to tuna fish. I also love to, I like to fish for anything. So I'm like, let's, let's cover some, let, let's take a detour to the fluke grounds. Like we were going to head, head to the shoals. I said, but let's kind of make our way behind the vineyard, get to some of the known tuna spots and we'll follow this, this, you know, contour line that a lot of times holds life and tuna life. And, and we'll basically take a detour to go fluking. So we get out there, and right away I see dolphins everywhere. I'm like, oh, this is a good sign. And I'm starting to rig up because I'm on someone else's boat. I'm starting to rig up all my jigging stuff. So I give my, my um, you know, my casting rod to the, the guy's 15-year-old son. And I'm like, listen, just get comfortable throwing this thing. Because if you haven't thrown a big tuna rod with a stick bait or something like that at tuna, you, it takes some time to get used to like really leaning into it and chucking it out there. And, and the kids, he's an athlete. He's, you know, but he's a small frame, 15 year old kid. I'm like, just throw this as far as you can get comfortable throwing the wind on through the guides and stuff. It's first cast. And I'm like, Oh, and when it lands count to 10 and then give it three slow turns and a rod sweep and pause and do that again. Cause I'm fishing a, a stick bait that you like to fish really slow. And, I go back to the back of the boat to to start getting the jigging gear all set up. And he goes, I got one. And I'm like, oh, man, there's got to be bluefish in here, right? And I'm like, there's no way you just first cast catch a tuna. Haven't seen a tuna yet. Haven't marked one yet. And then he's like, oh, it came off. So I'm like, all right, cast again. I'm like, there must be some bluefish in here because we're not far behind the vineyard. And um, I go back to tying on a jig. And I was trying to get like four rods. It was four of us. I was trying to get four jigging rods set up so that when we marked a wolf pack of fish, we could drop on them. So he casts again. He goes, hey, I got another one. And I'm like, damn it, there's blue fish in here. So I walk up there expecting nothing. And I look at the rod and I just see the tuna beats. And I'm like, and then it takes off. And I'm like, holy shit, dude, you got a tuna. I'm like, that's insane, right? So I'm like, all right, keep the rod tight. He's going to run in a bunch of different directions. Look at his dad. I'm like, he just hooked a tuna. I'm like, that's insane. So we ended up catching like 20 bluefin. They were 40, 50 pounders. But it was to the point where I'm like, hey, you haven't caught one yet to his old man. And he's like, I'm like, cast over there. There's dolphins right there. Cast over there. Tuna on. And then finally, I'm like, all right, listen, we're not going to get any overs. We got two 40-pound fish. It's enough for us. Do you guys want to go fluke? And if we ha- if we go fluke, and we have to leave right now, or we're going to miss the tide. He's like, everybody's like, yeah, I'm sick of pulling on tuna. And I'm like, you guys are nuts. <laughs> we're going to go leave a drop and reel tuna bite. We were catching them on jigs on the surface. It was insane. So I'm like, all right, let's go. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm leaving a drop and reel tuna bite to go catch freaking fluke, right? 
And those expectations were pretty high because the first time I took them out, the first fluke to hit the deck was a 12 and a half pounder. Yeah. The next one was a 11 pounder. And it was like, holy crap, like this is the best fluke I've ever seen. So they wanted to do that. So we go out there and it was uh, a full moon, which sucks. It can, it, it can change the fluke fishing a lot. And we caught more tuna than we caught keeper fluke. Yeah. It was one of those days. We kind of called that quick. Yeah. And I find out when I get back from a guy that does a lot of fluke fishing out there, he's like, dude, I know where you were fishing. He's like, they were in just a weird place, probably three miles to the south of you. And I'm like, why the hell were they there? He's like, they do weird shit on the full moon and learn something new that day. Yeah. You also learn that you never leave a tuna drop bite. Dumbest thing I've ever done in my, in my fishing life. But hey, wasn't my boat. I but was happy to be there. You caught a bunch. We did like, catch you, a, a you bunch. You left it to go search for the yep. anticipated target species. Yeah. You kind of you you got what yep. you wanted out of it. But I think one of the things that you brought up in that in that story was slow. Yeah. For tuna. Uh-huh. Uh huh. What I've seen out there, I see a lot of people working things really fast. Yep. And tuna are know, very fast. And I and I've had a few really like some of the best tuna captains always point this out. Hey, tuna are some of the fastest fish you'll fish for, but what they eat are really slow. slow. Yes. And that's so, where it clicked for me. So I think what if anybody's gonna take anything out of this conversation today is when you are out on the tuna grounds, calm your adrenaline. Because when you see the dolphins and you see the life, it's important to know that the food that they're feeding on. The little tiny sand eels, they're going to pop out. They're going to puke them up. They're anywhere from three to five inches. They're not moving that fast. And if you slow down your presentation, you can control your breathing. Mm -hmm. And you could slow down your presentation of your lures. You're going to hook up more than the guy that's going crazy. Now, that doesn't happen all the time. And you have to be able to determine on the fly what the bite is actually predicting. But in my experience out on the water, the slower you work things, the more time you take, the more time you leave that lure just outside that feeding zone where you, that, say, a sand eel is coming out and you're bringing your lure right out of that bait ball, there's probably like a 10-foot window yep. that they're really concentrated on looking for that little sand eel to pop out of that little bait ball, and that's what they're feeding on. And then when you bring it out of there too quick, you're you're – limiting the time in the strike zone. Yep. And that's just my experience. There's been days where we're jigging fast and it's working, sure. but also slow on the bottom is also killer as well. There's um, there's something to be said for that. I mean, you know, kind of pivoting back to soft plastics, it's like, you know, it's another bait. You just want to fish really slow. Like how, how talked about your preferred, you know, with your, pla your experience with soft plastics, you know, cover the water column on kind of how you like to fish the, those soft plastics that, that you that you make, that you fish with. So I'm a jig fisherman. Yeah. I'll be honest. Like I've always loved deep water jigging, mm -hmm. you know, half ounce to three ounce, five ounce. The canal was like really when I moved to Massachusetts yep. fifteen years ago, I was like, this is heaven. Yeah. Like I love jigging. There's nothing better to me than understanding the bottom mm -hmm. through constant contact. A contact, losing jigs, knowing where the sure. where the riffraff is. But finding out where that hole is. And then once you find that hole, it might not have fish today, but you come back to it a week from now on a different moon, that fish is going to be there. So I, depending on how the fish are biting, I always tend to start with jigging on the bottom or close to the bottom. And then I work my way up to the sure. surface because there's a lot of lures in between yep. that I can, I can fish. I could fish a skipper. I could fish a swim, a minnow plug, yep. right? To get that skipper on top, minnow plug, three to five feet down and then you have a jig yep in most cases and you can swim a jig you, you know you can keep you can it cover up high. the whole water column with with you know those three types of uh, of offerings that's a valid point i mean a jig can really work the entire yep. water column and that's why i think jigs outperform a lot of other lures because they're more versatile sure in certain situations yep. F feel is is i think as i've gotten more and more experienced fishing I think the biggest thing is having that feel and having that, you know, connection with what, what your mind's perceiving with what you're feeling at the end of your rod. I think that when you slow down, like, and start to really use that jig or that jig head or to really ply around and feel 
that bottom, what that's like. I think there's a lot of nuggets of, of clues within that process to say, all right, you know, there's a, there's a big rock underwater that I just felt. Now, if I can get that bait to come just up over that rock and drop down and make, you know, touch bottom again, a lot of times that's, you know, what's holding fish. You start feeling your way around things. You get a much deeper understanding for the spots that you fish. You do, as long as you're consistently going back to them. So if we're going to talk like an area like Block Island. Mm -hmm. So my biggest bass came off of Block Island. I never got the measurements on it, but there's a photo circulating the internet that we put out there. We see a lot of that one. That's a beautiful fish. That's my that's my trophy right there. Yep. It was released. It's still swimming around unless a shark ate it. Uh, so when I fish Block Island, like obviously my b- good friend Joe Diorio does too. Like I have always been. So we have a go to with jigs, right? Yep. Everyone has a go to style. So my go to style is let it hit the bottom, and I honestly let it hit the bottom, and then I pop it three times, and then reel, and I kind of bring in the slack of that three pop. Okay. And if I don't get a hit on that particular, I let it hit the bottom again, and then I pop it up three times and reel down. And as soon as I'm done reeling down, I usually get a, I usually get bit. Mm-hmm. Or that's the style of fishing that I do out there. And, you know, I, that's what has always worked for me. It doesn't matter. It's a reaction strike. I'm yeah. bringing it up off the bottom. It looks like the bait is in a panic mode. Sure. To me, if I'm a striped bass and I'm looking up, oh, that thing's out of sorts. It yeah. doesn't know what it's doing. Now it's going back to find cover and that yeah. fish is right on Now it. it's a competitive advantage for a predatory sure. fish. So Joe Diorio was like, oh, that's interesting. I've Let me try that out. And But I said, so what do you do? <laughs> he goes, I just let it hit the bottom, and then I reel it up three cranks and then hold. And then I let it hit the bottom, and I reel up three cranks and hold. So we were talking one day. He goes, he goes, I got to be honest with you. He goes, I really like your style. I go, really? He goes, yeah, I really like your style of like how you pop it up and you get the reaction strike. I go, Joe, you know what's funny? I really like your style. <laughs> we just like cast it down and reel it up three cranks. And we were laughing about that, yeah. like how like we bounce information off of each other and we use it and we liked it. Yeah. So now we, I, both of us actually fish both styles of that fishing to find out what the fish are actually what reacting want to that day. That yeah. day. So yeah. we, we, we maximize the, the style. That's awesome. What 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 would you say your favorite style of what, what's your favorite fish to chase? It's whatever season. It, no, whatever season it yeah. is. Like there I I'm passionate about striped bass. Yeah. I think I think northeast is known for striped bass. Sure. I love albie season. Don't we all? But I think I love what I love about albie season is the hype of yeah. albie season. There's such a pep rally such a short behind window. it. You it's know it's such coming. a it's a pep rally. Everyone's excited. Yeah. The rush of seeing those fish just like, you know, just blowing up bait. It's the fall. It's the unofficial start to the fall run. There's so much to love about that. It's it's really like Friday night lights. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's if you're small town America and you're like, it's Friday night, we got the football game, everyone's tailgating. To me, that's Albie season. Yeah. And I love them. And I love catching them. Yeah. They're fun. Uh, but I am very fortunate to live in the northeast and i love the seasons i love what we actually have here like it starts off with striped bass tog fluke sea bass back to striped bass albies bonita tuna yep tog and then you can go out for cod in the winter time tog are really the bookend to the uh to the in season i mean you have your ground fish that are residents that are you know your boat's out of the water you can jump on a party boat and go freeze your nuts off and go catch some fish that's awesome but like tog really bookend the the juice of the season yeah you know um and you've you've done a lot of you love to talk fish i know that i do it's 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 one of the more challenging fish to hook what's your what's your what's your uh how would you how would you kind of go play by play with how you deal with a tog bite how you fish for them so i think it's if you're you're starting off new right it's trial and error you want to go find structure, take a look at your, I think the best app you could pick up for yourself, especially in the off season or even now 
is Navionics. Yeah, that, the, the, I think it's ten dollars a year. The shading on that is the best. So if you, ha- yeah, exactly. It's so if so you good. have, so if you have ten dollars, how many nights have you stayed up and just poured over Navionics's chart and just been like, <laughs> oh my god, look at this little nodule I found. I bet you that holds fish. I love it when they update it, and I'm like, what's new? Yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> Oh my God, I've been, I've just gone down the rabbit hole up at night looking for new spots on that stuff. And then it gets to the point where it's like, I've marked so much shit. Now I've lost track of what I've actually fished and haven't fished. Do you know what's, uh, you know what? I love that. That's like the best part. But what, you know what's interesting about Navionics? It's everything you think you know yeah. about fishing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, those fish weren't there. Yeah. They were in a completely different spot where you would, not even expect Mm -hmm. now the maps open up to a whole new level of three-dimensional view like it's flat structure next to you you start looking at where those fish were it is it was rocks but it was sandy bottom next to the rocks eight feet over and you're looking at them and you're like dude i pulled a nine pound tog out of that now you look at navionics and a whole dude different set yeah. of eyes like it's you ever see those photos where you see two things like you see like a dude yeah. reading a book yeah. and then next thing you know you see a chicken yeah yeah exactly those navionic apps they change on me every single season yeah. based on the previous years and previous years yeah it's always good to go and, and, and can like when you have a, a, a banner day or you fish a new spot that was really productive it's going back and looking at what that what that spot has like what that makeup is of that spot and it it does it brings a study element to fishing of why things maybe happen or why why a spot was productive and then it starts to give you one piece of a puzzle which it's always changing there's tides there's moon phases there's bait there's so many different variables. time of year time of year water temperature it's on and on and on and on water clarity it's it's almost impossible to ever it is impossible to ever figure it out to a t but it gives you one piece of the puzzle and then you get the next piece and then you start to figure out like all right well here are the characteristics that made that spot productive that day with these conditions yeah and then you know the next time you're there it's a different set of conditions and the place sucks but now you start to log that in the back of your mind and it's like all right well now i know if if i got a you know three quarter moon and the tide is you know is is in this stage and whatever it is it's it, it's one piece of the puzzle I always used to say fishing is a puzzle with never ending puzzle pieces. Yeah, I'm terrible with like understanding the tides. And I know you guys, like Jimmy, like, like no, all I, my friends are yeah, like. It, it drives me crazy how yeah. dialed they are into like moon phases and tides. And I'm like, I just don't think I have the fo- ability to focus at that degree to be able to, you know, kind of tie that into things. I agree. I, I mean, with three daughters, a business. Yeah everything else I got to do when I can go fishing or when that time's dedicated to fishing, I don't care what the tides are. Sometimes I just like to veg out and be fishing. I'll be, uh, I'll be driving fish. to a spot and I'll be like, Oh, what's the tide? I'll go on to, all right, it's coming yeah. in. Okay. I got a plan now. Like sure. I have like somewhat of an idea yeah. of what's going on, but most of the time I don't, I can't, I have to, I, I fly by the seat of my pants based off experience yeah. and it's might not be the, best way it's a lot of a lot of it's just gut and instinct at this stage it's like whatever i have a window to go fishing and once i get there i'll try to figure it out i want to make it out to be the best day i possibly can exactly and i can't waste hours because what ends up happening is you go down the rabbit hole and you start Uh thinking then you come up with a plan i I like to just take a look at what's in front of me and be like okay so we're gonna move here i have six or seven places mapped out and next thing you know that's what i have time for that's what i have time for like i don't I have three kids. Sure. I, I, I do coaching. I coach their basketball. I coach their softball. So I, when the time per allows, when I'm allowed the time to do what I got to do mm-hmm. for the business and for my mental health, I will make the best yeah. of it based off my previous knowledge. What, uh, what are you most looking forward to this season? Fishing as much as I possibly can. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm really looking forward to tuna season right around the corner yep i'm looking forward to the rest of today we have that new product launch coming out so i think hopefully when i get home I, it's gonna be like christmas for me i have like a stock of boxes nice. ready to go uh i'm excited for the next step in joe bags not necessarily a new product but sure. like taking a small 
I, I look at like anything in the fishing industry, at, at least at my level, is like a micro business. It's not even yeah. like a yeah, small business. I mean, it started business. in your garage, and you, you can't walk into many shops in the Northeast without seeing multiple Joe Bags products. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool star story of the little man getting it into his basement from six to, or um, shed from six to midnight to, you know, being kind of in every in every shop in the northeast and with with one of your m multiple products that catch everything from tog to stripers to you tuna know. Uh, yeah to tuna with the big resin jigs and stuff too yeah yeah so like i look forward to just constant you know what i look forward to i look i'll be honest like i love our audience yeah. i love people who send us photos they, the community aspect is, is the community really awesome. is really what it comes down to uh Every morning I wake up to like somebody catching a fish or the next day, like it's, it's gotten to the point where enough people are fishing it and they're catching on to the point that like our story, like our story sure. say on Instagram is for my audience. Yeah. Yeah. Like I share everyone. As long That's as it's going to be pretty cool. And I love seeing them. And then you hear the stories. Hey man, I, I outfished my buddies last night that were fishing X, Y, and Z yeah, on yeah. your stuff. And it's going to be super gratifying. Or I love this product during this particular time. And they tell you the stories and the interactions are small, Yeah, but I'll tell you right now, they mean a lot to me. They, they really That's do awesome. motivate everything I do. And I love hearing from our audience, from new people. Like I love hearing your experiences, and I'm willing to share anything you guys have because you guys great. are my, you guys are our community. The uh, like when I always, you know, running the boat and having you know people come along for that ride, and be you know on your boat for that program. I always kind of like felt responsible for ever, any of the catches. Like, you know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm running the boat. This is kind of my program. This is my game plan. So-and-so caught an awesome fish. I'm super happy for them. But like, you could kind of take a little bit of credit or at least feel that gratification of being part of that for, for that person that they're going to talk about forever. To be able to do that on a scale where it's like complete strangers that just happen to pick up one of your, one of your products and, you know, have a story to share with you yeah is pretty special you must kind of feel like all right well i can take one slice of the gratification out of that because i feel like i was part of that success which is awesome you know i i do love that i i, I always say thank you for being a part like letting us be a part of your bag yeah that's like awesome. like you 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 believed in it you saw enough information you said i'm gonna apply this and when they send us the photo i love just being in every surf casters every boater's bag that's like great. you could pull one out and you know give it a go Let's uh, let's try to see if uh, that yellowfin bite comes back and makes something happen. I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna great. text you. I'm not even gonna. I'm gonna text you. Yeah. Just. I mean, hey, I'm gonna say, hey, you know listen. You got three kids. I got two kids. I mean, I'm just gonna say it's happening. It's happening. And like yeah. during that time of year, it's like either you're in or you're yeah, out. Yeah, of course. Like, I don't have time to like. Yeah. I got to. I got to put no. together two guys. It's, so that's. Uh, that but I'm sounds... hoping. That you guys take me up on my opportunity this year. Yeah, if uh, if it all works out, then we'll be there and uh, we'll go and I'll find them. Yeah, we'll, we'll go Maybe. have some fun with them. <laughs> Maybe I'll find bluefin. I don't know about the yellowfin. Yeah. That's always tough when they come in. But yeah, I I, I haven't done that. I want to catch yellowfin on top. I want to jig yellowfin. It's always been you know kind of a troll deal or a chunk deal. So yep. um, that Chunk's would be fun. that'd be new. It is fun. It is fun. It's all it's all fun. What isn't fun? Live line is fun. Chunking is fun. Anytime, fun. It's, anytime you get a tuna, it's yeah. called fun. Uh, it's right around the corner. I can't wait. For you. Yeah. Rumors are, but what do I know? Well, Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you on. Um, we'll have to do this again sometime and definitely have to bend a rod together. Yeah, let's do it. No, thanks for having me on. I'm glad uh, you gave us the, uh, the platform to share our story and talk about this coming year and fishing the Northeast. I'm excited to see what's next, buddy. Thanks again. Thank you.